Good evening. Good evening, dear guests from Germany, Israel, and the rest of the world, and welcome to the 10th annual Busirius Lecture. My name is Cedric Cohen Scali. I am the director of the Busirius Institute for Research of Contemporary German History and Society. We are convening this evening to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the Busirius Institute at the University of Haifa. And to celebrate also the 20th anniversary of our collaboration with Zeitstiftung Ebelin und Gerd Busirius, based in the city of Hamburg. Since the very beginning of the Busirius Institute, 20 years ago, we have profited from the generous support of the Zeit Stiftung. We are very grateful for this support and the achievement of the Busirius Institute over these 20 years have proven how successful our collaboration has been. In the three main areas that define the mandate of the Busirius Institute, we can see remarkable results. Thus, our first goal is to develop an autonomous research on a wide range of topics linked to contemporary German history and society. Over these 20 years, the Changing Busirius team has published many books. In fact, 22 and more are in the making in leading academic publishing houses and many articles in leading scientific journals. Our goal is to organize academic events and academic exchange between Israel and Germany. It would be no exaggeration to say that we have organized over these 20 years, hundreds of academic events and facilitated hundreds of academic exchanges between Israel and Germany. Our third goal is to support young researchers from Israel and Germany. Here again, we are proud to have supported thousands of young Israeli and German researchers in their academic development. Please visit our website and see the profile of the 12 current researchers at the Busirius Institute and our current projects. Now that I have briefly presented the achievements of the Busirius Institute, I would like to present you the man without whose constant efforts the Busirius Institute would not have been possible. This man is our distinguished guest lecturer this evening, Professor Manfred Landstein. Professor Manfred Landstein is a member of the Board of Trustees of the Zeitstiftung Ebelin and und Gerd Busserius in Hamburg. Professor Landstein runs his own consultancy company, Landstein and Partner International Consultant, and is member of several supervisory and advisory boards. Professor Landstein started his federal political career in 1977 as state secretary in Germany's Federal Ministry of Finance. Between 1980 and 1982, he served as the head of the chancellor's office. Subsequently, in 1982, Professor Lahnstein became Germany's Federal Minister of Finance under Chancellor Helmut Schmidt. Professor Lahnstein has been a professor of cultural management for 25 years and is author of six books and numerous articles and essays. He was the president of the German-Israeli Association for over a decade and has been awarded honorary doctorates by the universities of Hamburg and Haifa. He is an honorary chairman 
of the Board of Governors of Haifa University. Professor Lanstein is married to Sonia Lanstein, also a great benefactor of the University of Haifa. They both have two children and five grandchildren. I would like to add to this presentation a personal note. I have been working regularly with Professor Lanstein in the last three years. Huh? Sorry, please, please mute yourself. And I was always impressed by his commitment to the University of Haifa and to the Busirius Institute in particular. This commitment was particularly visible in his kindness and very human approach to the entire team of the Busirius Institute. Thank you so much, Professor Lanstein. Today, Professor Lanstein will be speaking in his lecture of 1,700 years of Jewish life in Germany, a history of prejudice. But before hearing Professor Lanstein lex lecture, the president of the University of Haifa, Professor Ron Rubin, who unfortunately could not join our Zoom meeting this evening, sent us a video with words of thanks to Professor Lanstein and the Zeit Stiftung. Let's hear Professor Rubin's greeting and then Professor Lanstein, the floor will be yours. Dear friends from the Zeit Foundation and dearest Manfred Lanstein, in this year, we mark two different events which, however, are closely connected to each other. The first one is the 20th anniversary of the Butzerius Institute for Research of Contemporary German History and Society. The second one is 1,700 years of Jewish existence on German soil. One of the many effects of German-Jewish-Israeli history and interweaving is the foundation of the Butzerius Institute at the University of Haifa. It happened 20 years ago, thanks to the great endeavor of Professor Manfred Lanstein and the Zeit Foundation. So, during these 20 years, the Butzerius Institute has published dozens of articles and books on German history and society from a variety of different perspectives. The Butzerius Institute has hosted German students, German researchers, and many distinguished guests from German politics, arts, and culture. Among them, just to mention a few, were Christian Wolf, the former German president, and Ms. Rita Susmuth, former president of the Bundestag. I would like to express my deep respect and gratitude to Professor Amos Maurice Reich, former director, as well as the current director, Dr. Cedric Cohen Scully. Thank you very much, both of you. Further, I would like to express my gratitude to Manfred and the Zeit Foundation for their continued support to the Butzerius Institute. We greatly appreciate your profound contributions and efforts to bring together Christians and Jews, Germans and Israeli. One of the greatest outcomes of these efforts was the awarding of the honorary doctor to Angela Merkel from our university some time ago. So I hope and wish our university Manfred and the Zeit Foundation, many, many more years of fruitful collaboration. Dear Manfred, you are a close and great friend of our university. And I know that you even consider the university to be your university. Shalom. So please, Professor Lanstein, the floor is yours. And after the lecture, Professor Lanstein will be happy to answer to your question directly. Please, Professor Lanstein. Unmute yourself, Professor Lanstein. Understood. Will I be understood? Yes, now I see. It's OK? Thank you, Cedric, dear Cedric, dear Ron Robin, dear friends of our university. Greetings from, from Hamburg. 
Greetings from the Zeit Foundation and especially from its CEO, Chairman, President, Michael Göring, who is as deeply involved in this affair as I am. It is my great pleasure to deliver this year's Guterio's lecture, albeit I can reach you only via the Zoom screen. For me, apart from 20 years of the Institute, three important events mark this year. The so-called Jekes Museum, the Museum of German Jews who came to Palestine and to Israel, is moving from Tefen to our campus and will find its new home in the realm of the Hecht Museum. A heartfelt todaraba to all those who have contributed to this welcome development. Furthermore, as has been said, we are commemorating 700 years of Jewish life in Germany. That is reason enough to make this event the topic of my lecture. And finally, an upsurge of open anti-Semitism in my country can be observed, especially in the wake of the latest conflict between Israel and Hamas. Please allow an introductory remark. I will not speak about the Nazi period and the Shoah. There are two reasons for it. We all know about the unique crimes and horrors of that period. I assume that we are all well informed about those years of terror and the attempted extinction of the Jewish people. So let us just remember this period in Paul Celan's words, death is a master of Germany. This evening, I want to stress that Jewish life in Germany has always been a life of apprehension and discrimination. Practically all the elements of Nazi ideology had been in place before Adolf Hitler came to power. They did not fall from heaven. And that is why a view on Jewish life in Germany and the historic responsibility of the non-Jewish Germans has to encompass the long centuries before 1933. The origin, 1700 years of Jewish life in Germany. Well, the date has been chosen because of the first documented mention of that life in an edict of Emperor Constantine, which is dated December 11, 321. It is addressed to the city councillors of Colonia Agrippina, today's Cologne. It allows Jews to enter the city senate. By the way, that was a gift of doubtful value since it obliged those Jewish citizens to fully advance the tax payments imposed by the emperor's treasury. Thus, there have been fully taxable Roman citizens of Jewish religion in Cologne by then. Let us be clear. We are talking about Jews in the Roman Empire, not about Jews in Germany. Germany did not yet exist. We may conclude that Jews have dwelt in the Roman provinces on the Rhine and the Moselle a lot earlier. Followed a period of some 400 years after the end of the Roman Empire, about which we have no direct, no documented testimony of Jewish life in Germany. However, we may conclude indirectly that there must have been a Jewish presence on the banks of Rhine and Moselle during the great migration of the Germanic people as well. The Middle Ages, follow the Merovingians, follow the Franks, follow Charlemagne. This great emperor and statesman has placed his Jewish subjects under a specific imperial protection. And there's a striking similarity between Constantine and Charlemagne. Both have acted out of a rational calculation, not out of active tolerance or magnanimity. For Charlemagne, the Jewish merchants with their widespread contacts and experience were indispensable 
to organize international trade and of particular importance the Jews offered a highly welcome counterweight against the Christian monks by whom the church incessantly tried to influence the politics of Europe. Later on, the Heilige Römische Reich Deutscher Nation, the Holy Roman Empire of German nation came into being under Emperor Otto I and his followers. During that period, the influence of the bishops grew as well. They had become important worldly powers. And they could not do without the Jews either. The bishops of Augsburg, Regensburg, or Salzburg have invited Jewish merchants to settle in their cities already at the end of the ninth century. The Jewish community in Cologne built its new synagogues in 1021 closely followed by Mainz, Worms, Speyer, and Trier. And Jewish communities did not only flourish in imperial cities or bishops' residences, but in many places in the wider Rhinelands. Names like Ahrweiler, Bacharach, Oppenheim, or Landau date from this period. In this way, a large community of Jews in Germany has grown over a relatively short time. Since then, we are talking about the Ashkenazim. And Jewish life was marked by the first version of Yiddish. Its vocabulary was composed by Germanic, Latin, and Hebrew elements. In the earlier medieval period, a power structure gradually developed, which should become decisive for the fate of the Jews and which has had its effect well into modern times. I'm speaking of the power triangle of state, church, and society. The structure of the states was authoritarian. It was rather rational, however. Those in power made their judgment dependent on the practical usefulness of their subjects not that much upon their religious origins. On the other hand, the church tried everything to realize and to solidify her power aspirations. To this effect, it used shameful ideological dogmas like the one of the Jews as the murderers of Christ. The weak side of the above mentioned power triangle, well, it was the normal people or what we would call today society. Most of the townships had not yet developed their own personality. Middle classes did not exist. A gray and difficult everyday life prevailed essentially marked by Christian creed and pseudo Christian superstition. No wonder then that the Jewish communities could not find a secured place in those structures. No wonder either that they became a welcome target of rude prejudice and grim hatred when the Crusades directed their irrational ire not only against the Muslim occupiers of the Holy Land, but as well against the Jews, the murderers of Christ at home. More than 5,000 Jews in the Rhinelands fell victim to the First Crusade of the years 1095, 1096. 50 years later, the terrible mass suicides of the Jewish communities in Mainz and Worms left dead respectively 1,100 and 800 people. Very important in the longer term, Christian merchants drove their Jewish competitors out of the international trade. Jewish traders were forced into a corner, dealing in money and credit, an activity which at that time was forbidden for Christians. For quite a while, Jews had been an accepted, at least a tolerated element of the cultures in which they lived. Now they became the marked ones. And I mean this market literally. In 1215, a Lateran council 
stated that Jews should wear the ill-famed yellow spot fixed to their clothing. That's what we have to remember. Many of the elements which should then mark anti-Jewish hatred and anti-Semitism well into our times were in place already in the Middle Ages, an unbelievable superstition which was not or only scarcely fought by the church, xenophobia, the irascible enmity of stout Christians, and more and more, the fight against Jewish competition. And yet, there is convincing proof that the Jews in Germany have produced impressive examples of strong cohesion and great intellectual achievement. There was a problem, however. The deep spiritual sources of this achievement remained hidden to non-Jews, a problem which has not completely disappeared even today. We have to add to it the fact that Jewish scholarship expressed itself in Hebrew, a language nobody understood outside of the community. All that appeared to non-Jews combined with strange habits and traditions as mysterious, if not outright as weird, followed the abominable crimes committed against the Jews in Germany during the years of the Great Plague in 1348-1349. Uh, Already at that time, dear friends, the world was full of fake news which spread with lightning speed, the poisoning of wells, the desecration of consecrated wafers, the ritual murder of children, there had to be a scapegoat with which to explain the pandemic. And the Jews were the traditional scapegoat. Almost everywhere in Germany, they became helpless victims of a wild mob. And in many cases, Christian authorities willingly supported the killing. It was during this period that many Jewish families left their traditional homesteads in Germany and emigrated to the east, to Poland. King Casimir III had started a large welcoming campaign in his Polish-Lithuanian territory. This far-sighted ruler had appraised the important role of a strong Jewish population <clears throat> in the modernization of his backward provinces. And that is how the Ashkenazim have contributed decisively to the development of a big and splendid Jewish community in Eastern Europe. The narrow-minded authorities in Germany not only let those families emigrate, they kicked them out as many examples show us. And the others, those who remained, were more and more cooped up in secluded quarters of the cities. The term ghetto became a questionable trademark for those quarters. At that time, you would have easily found a Judengasse in almost every German city. And this changed the situation of the Jews considerably. They were separated, they were excluded. And that is why the notion of ghetto not only designates a locality, but a state of mind as well. However, it was here in the Judengassen that the Jews built impressive communities, which would have served as examples for their Christian neighbors as well. A community council, most often of seven men, managed communal institutions, such as the synagogue, the cemetery, the mikveh, the slaughterhouse, and the hospital. It was here in the Judengassen that they were able to organize and to exercise those activities which the world, the authorities, or the church had not or not yet forbidden. Almost all craftsmen's uh, professions were forbidden which fostered a concentration on trade and banking. With talent, with luck and a lot of work, you could become a supplier of a person of authority or even found your own banking business. However, 
the Schnorrer outnumbered the well-to-do people. Basic material conditions were hard for the great majority. One thing has to be remembered in this context, however, the unique Jewish system of education. Yes, it was closely linked to religion and did not leave much space for worldly matters. Yes, formal education clearly centered on boys. However, theology was the mother of all science and of all education for the Christians as well. And schools did not open to girls either. On the other hand, the education system of the Jewish communities comprised almost all boys and young men. And that has immensely fostered many, many examples of impressive intelligence and creativity. And as far as the girls and young women were concerned, yes, they may have been regarded as the minor children of their parents or subject to their husbands. However, many of them learned at least to read and many of them to write as well. The often cited and famous Glickel von Hameln may have been an exception, but it has not been an isolated case. To sum it up, in the period of the late Middle Ages, the power triangle of state, church and society had changed in so far as the urban society was structured in a much clearer way. Social strata had consolidated. All that influenced daily routine, the choice of a partner or clothing habits. But they all had one thing in common, Christian religion and the strong links to its representatives and preachers. And the so-called Reformation in Germany has not changed that a bit. The Dominican monks indoctrinated from the pulpit, and so did Martin Luther. Towards the end of his life, he has published some disgraceful pamphlets, one of them titled about the Jews and their lies. Luther was absolutely clear in how Protestants should deal with Jews, burn down their synagogues and schools, take the Talmud and the other holy scriptures away, condemn them to forced labor. Yes, this side of Martin Luther is part of the German history as well. Basically, these structures of the late Middle Ages have remained predominant well into the 18th century, we like to talk about and to remember the few who perhaps made it out of the ghetto. We like to talk about the bankers and the court suppliers. Well, but even someone like Maya Amschel Rothschild was not in a position to leave Frankfurt's Judengasse. In 1785, Rothschild by then was a famous and widely recognized personality he asked Frankfurt's authorities permission to take walks on the green walls in order to strengthen his health. This permission was outright refused in 1785. At that time, Lessing had died already <clears throat> and Goethe was serving as a minister in Weimar. And as far as the so-called Hofjuden court suppliers are concerned, they might have enjoyed a protected, privileged, and sometimes a luxurious life at the princely courts. However, this protection ended when the prince died or simply withdrew his support. In the early 18th century, Joseph. <laughs> Josef Wieske in Oppenheimer is an especially dramatic example. Enlightenment, an all too short interlude. Let us start our glimpse on the period of enlightenment with the great Moses Mendelssohn. Moses Mendelssohn followed his teacher from Dessau to Berlin in 1784. 
Talia, could you get out? Thank you. Let us start our glimpse on the period of enlightenment with the great Moses Mendelssohn. Moses Mendelssohn followed his teacher from Dessau to Berlin in 1743 when he was 15 years old. In the capital of Prussia, he won fame by an absolutely extraordinary intellectual performance. Later on, he created the German translation of the Torah, which was completely printed by 1783, German translation of the Torah, albeit in Hebrew letters. The Orthodox rabbis were outraged, yet Mendelssohn stood fast by his convictions. These convictions included a limited integration into non-Jewish Western cultures. His friendship with Gottfried Ephraim Lessing, the latter's essential theater piece, Nathan der Weise, and the famous Parable of the Rings are proof of these convictions. Limited integration, I have said, in his main work titled Jerusalem, Mendelssohn states his fundamental belief. It is the law, the law revealed by God, which constitutes the unchanging, the eternal element of the special position of the Jewry. Based upon this firm belief and other thoughts, he formulates one of the central ideas of the Enlightenment. A Jew can be, no, a Jew is a fully equal fellow human being while maintaining and upholding his belief. Wilhelm von Doven, the Prussian chief archivist, went a step further. He accused the prejudice-ridden non-Jews to be responsible for the deplorable circumstances under which their Jewish neighbors had to live. The so-called Edict of Emancipation became a part of the Hardenberg reforms in 1812. And there was movement on the Jewish side as well. David Friedlander, a pupil of Mendelssohn, had founded the first Jewish high school, free school, already in 1778. This type of school, which quickly found successes in other Jewish communities, offered a secular education next to the traditional Jewish one. So far, so good. However, if we raise the idealizing curtain, we have to acknowledge that the Enlightenment has not really reached the broader German society. Enlightenment, as essential as it is for all of us until today, had been a brainchild, not a revolution. And if I say broader German society that includes the Jewish communities as well, the great majority of them continued to live in isolation and in poverty. No wonder then that the forceful anti-liberal reaction came soon to the forefront. The fight of the Germans against Napoleon contained the fight against French imports as well. And for many Germans, this included the fight against the basic values of the French Revolution. And another important problem arose, the quest for a German nation. Influential thinkers such as, uh, such as Fichte, Arndt, or the Ilfim Turnfather Jan defined the German nation on a populistic and romanticizing basis. For them and many, many others, the nation was not a community of values, but a community of descent, of origin. A community not of values, but a community of descent, of origin. This turning point is of decisive importance. It has defined the seed of secular antisemitism. The traditional prejudices have been enriched by new ones, cultural, nationalistic, ideological, and a little later, racist prejudices as well. There have been liberal counterweights, of course. 
that is why we should remember and honor Gabriel Riesa from Hamburg. This Jewish member of the 1848 Faustkirchen Assembly has been decisively influential for a proclamation of basic rights which was adopted by the Frankfurt Assembly. We may read in Article 5, I quote, legal and civic rights are neither defined nor limited by religious creed. Nowadays, it has become a good tradition to remember 1848. The Paulskirchen Assembly and this proclamation of basic rights. However, we are not allowed to forget 1849, a year later. The counter revolutionary reaction of the kings, the princes, and the nobility as a whole fought back. And that is why the full equality of rights for the Jews in Germany has been realized only in 1871, after the foundation of the German of the German Reich. In the meantime, Jews have actively pursued their fight for emancipation and equality, yet this fight was not necessarily following the postulates of Moses Mendelssohn or the already mentioned Article 5 of the Paulskirchen Constitution. Many Jews have fostered their distance to the synagogue because that seems to be the necessary entrance ticket to the prevailing German culture. And others have tried to find a solution in a conversion to the Christian religion. This has been a small minority, however. The German Empire, a heyday for Jews in Germany. The period of the German Empire, which lasted from 1871 to 1918, is often described as a heyday for Jewish life in Germany. I believe that a more cautious look is needed. Yes, this period is abundantly rich with great Jewish achievement, and there are several reasons for it. The Industrial Revolution played a preponderant role. Industrial Revolution offered chances hitherto quite unknown to Jewish entrepreneurs, and they grasped them resolutely. Let me mention only Emil Rathenau, the father of the legendary AEG, great Jewish bankers such as the Rothschilds or Bleichröder, Bismarck's private financier. Let us remember important Jewish publishers, such as Rudolf Mosse, who founded the Berliner Tagblatt, the first product of mass publication. Let us not forget Albert Berlin, Europe's biggest ship owner and a personal friend of Emperor Wilhelm II. However, we cannot ignore the, that the secular anti-Semitism of that time then equated the Jews with capitalism, that destroyer of a pretended venerable, pure German way of life. It was easy to incite the little German shop owner against the big department stores of Keats, Wertheim, and the like. And then the Jewish community itself underwent a sweeping sociological and demographic change as well. In the middle of the 19th century, more than half of the Jews in Germany had been desperately poor. One would have found Schnorrer at almost each street corner. But now a new Jewish middle class came into being. A rapid urbanization engulfed Jewish families as well, whereas in 1870, only 20% of them had lived in big cities. More than 60% did so only 40 years later. The majority of these people strive for more than a formally equal position. Strange as it seems, they wanted national identification as well. Already in 1870, the magazine Der Israelit had written, we, the German Jews, are Germans and nothing else. One considered oneself as a part of the young German nation or the aid of Jewish or later on mosaic confession. And nobody has taken German culture and science more seriously 
than the Jewish middle classes. They conquered the liberal profession, medical doctors, lawyers, journalists, theater people, or musicians. Quite naturally, the piano was part of a solid household, and so were the season tickets for the opera or the concert hall. Bildung, education, that was the magic word. No wonder then that 10% of all university students in Berlin were Jewish compared to less than 1% in the total population. However, and this is important to note, despite of a far-reaching integration of so many Jews into the culture of the non-Jewish German majority, the societal and cultural separation remained stubbornly strong. Large parts of the German society kept their distances, persisted in their discrimination. And this may have been one of the reasons why a new movement came to the forefront, Zionism. The dynamic urge with young Jews to develop their own specific personality had been the initial force behind it. Their question was as simple as it was groundbreaking. Why shouldn't there be a Jewish nation with its own history and culture? And so a Zionist Union for Germany was formed in 1897 the sufferings of the Jews in Eastern Europe became a pressing topic, and more and more Jerusalem and with it Palestine became the place of the Zionist yearning. However, the majority of the Jews in Germany, many important rabbis included, shook their heads and remained sceptical. They were afraid that Zionism would strengthen the hands of the anti semit and nothing else. Back to this anti-Semitism. For the normal non-Jewish German bourgeoisie, its prejudices and cliches had remained a firm element of thinking and of feeling. They were part of their cultural code. We are accustomed in this context to cite Richard Wagner, and that with good reason. Let me choose another German, darling, Wilhelm Busch, who remains immensely popular until today. Wilhelm Busch has composed a poem called Klisch und Plum in 1882, of which I offer my personal clumsy translation. Short trousers and a long mane, a hooked nose and a hooked cane, the eyes are black and the soul is gray. The hat lopsided and the smiling white. That is Mulchen Schiefer by now. The others look a lot, lot by now. It couldn't be much worse. And the notion of we others marks the beginning of an anti Semitism which was not just the sum of prejudice but became a firm and comprehensive ideology. And the notion of race became the cornerstone of that ideology. Heinrich von Streitschwe, a star among German historians, taught in 1879, the Jews are our disaster. From here, it was only a short road to the national elections of 1893, which flushed 18 representatives of openly anti Semitic parties into the Reichstag, our parliament then. All in all, the German version of anti Semitism was complete well ahead of World War I. World War I, the Great War, determined the fate of the German Empire. In 1914, at its beginning, young men in their hundreds of thousands, and many young Jews amongst them had rushed eagerly to the battlefield. They had not given up their hope for respect and recognition. But then, in 1916, Berlin ordered a so called Juden Zählung, a census of Jewish soldiers in the army. 
government and general staff thus followed unfounded reproaches according to which young Jewish men try to avoid military service. This order resulted in a deep and in many cases traumatic disappointment. The country which one was prepared to give his life for seemed disposed to miserable treatment. The Weimar Republic, a last despite 1919, after the defeat in World War I, Germany had to find new structures for the state and new forms of government. It had to do so quickly and in an absolutely radical way. One of the inevitable consequences, a deadly strengthening of totalitarian and reactionary forces. The breeding ground for a radical anti-Semitism <laughs> flourished quickly. Beware, I am not talking only about the NSDAP, the Nazi party. The Deutsche Nationale Volkspartei, the NVP, for instance, which had excluded Jewish members quite early, proudly showed 950,000 members in 1923. The dominating circles of the defunct empire adhered to this party. When this disgusting lampoon of the so-called Protocols of the Wise Men of Zion was published in a German version, hundreds of thousand copies were sold in a matter of weeks. The balancing powers in politics and society were too weak. A rampant inflation and the, then the big economic crisis contributed to the weakening of democracy and the sense of decency. The anti-Semitism anti of the word became the anti-Semitism of the deed. Let us remember Rosa Luxemburg, Kurt Eisner, and Walter Rathenau. Looking at that decade from a slightly different angle, the so-called golden twenties were all but golden. Those years of the Weimar Republic were a dream for the Jews in Germany, but a dream which would degenerate into a nightmare all too quickly. They had to serve as scapegoats once again, were accused of being the real reason for the German defeat in the war, for economic misery and social disaster. A conscious Jew had then to critically examine himself if he wanted to stay and not to leave the country. Franz Rosenzweig and Martin Buber are outstanding examples of this self -reason. Other equally outstanding men and women found a prominent place in science and culture. Who of us could forget Albert Einstein or Max Reinhardt to pick just two out of the multitude? They may serve as an example for all those who remain resolved to defend their place in German life and society against all adversity. Well, latest in January 1933, this resolve turned out to be a cruel delusion. After 1945, for Germany, both Hitler's coming to power and the end of his reign in 1945 have meant an enormous turning point. The country was demolished and destroyed, physically, mentally, and morally. Chaos was the rule of the immediate post-war years, the chaos in which those few Jews had to find their way who had survived the years of the Shoah in a hiding place or in one of the concentration camps. Pressing material needs, food, shelter, clothing have determined the daily lives everywhere. The great majority of the Germans has needed much time to grasp the full dimension of the horrendous crimes against humanity which had been committed in their name. Many of them didn't even want to grasp. They simply suppressed or denied reality. It was only in the 60s in the period of the Eichmann and the Auschwitz trials that a broader and more open discussion 
of the Jews in Germany, their horrible fate, and their ill-defined future began. Traditional antisemitism was pushed back, although it never disappeared completely. With clear statements against antisemitism, both churches, the Protestants and the Catholics, helped in this push back. Secular antisemitism based on Nazi racism was repressed by some, but it was actively combated by many. On the other hand, it's only natural that Jewish life in Germany developed only hesitantly. However, a group of Jewish communities was founded with up to 40,000 members in total. And a new anti-sizive factor came into place at that time. The foundation of the State of Israel in 1948 and its heroic self-assertion in the Six Days War of 1967. Eretz Israel became a powerful anchor for the Jews in Germany. Very often, the non-Jewish Germans were and remain incapable to differentiate between Jews and Israelis. And then, especially after the 1973 Yom Kippur War, the so-called anti-Zionism anti shot up in a self-appointed German intelligentsia, an idea which very often equals and still equals a crude anti-Semitism. From 1990 onwards, the Jewish communities in Germany had to face a new enormous challenge, immigration from the areas of the former Soviet Union. The communities grew very quickly from some 40,000 to some 120,000 members. Material needs were and remained pressing and the integration of the immigrants was and remained complicated. Alas, this development remains unnoticed by the non-Jewish Germans. By the way, until now I am talking about the old Federal Republic of Germany while speaking about Germany. Jewish life in the former GDR, that would need a separate place. All in all, realities, symbols, and gestures of a better German Jewish understanding have come about during the last decade, and both sides have contributed to it. Some of it may be contributed to the insecurity and or the bad conscience of the non Jewish Germans, but most of it is serious, however. Yet, one absolutely basic factor has remained constant over all those 1700 years. The Jews have lived the lives of a minority. We are not allowed to explain their long history as a continuous succession of atrocities committed against them. In such a way, we would neglect the periods of more peaceful coexistence as well as the reality of the exceptional achievements and contributions of the Jews themselves. Yet, to use a word by the German scholar Julius Serp, the anomalous has always been the normal. Is it different today? Well, basically, it is not. As long as synagogues and other Jewish institutions in Germany have to be secured by police, as long as young men cannot wear their kippah in public quite naturally, as long as a new anti-Semitism creeping up from the middle of the German society, from white supremacism, and more and more from the wicked teachings of radical Islam, it is not. As long as this anti Semitism is not being fought with result and success, we have to fight for a better Germany. We have to fight for a Germany in which people respect different religious convictions and different ideas how to live, in which people simply meet each other as human beings. This calls addressed to his contemporaries by Moses Mendelssohn, 
some 250 years ago, remained as pressing as it was in his time. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Lahnstein, for this broad uh, overview of 1,700 years of Jewish life in Germany, a history of prejudice. Now the floor is open to questions. Please, uh, uh, Professor Goring, and unmute yourself and ask the question. I saw you raise your hand. Well, I raised my hand really to applaud Manfred Lahnstein for his great lecture. I didn't really want to ask a question, but since you asked me, there's one thought that I had had for quite some while. And I think Manfred Lahnstein, I never really expressed it to you, but do you think, maybe it's a bold idea. We have all entered now the age of diversity. And when you look at the acknowledgments, the recognition of so many minorities in the sexual field, in the religious field, in national field, do you think there might be a chance that this age of diversity could work against anti-Semitism? That this is a chance for our society to acknowledge, to recognize Jewism just as many, many other forms of how people live and what people believe in. Under a basic condition. But Moses Mendelssohn said it in his way, to respect the other with his different position in diversity as a human being. A human being is defined by human dignity, for us in Germany, for me personally, by the preamble of our constitution. If we have a sufficiently common base of ideas and perceptions and values, then diversity may help. As diversity shows itself today very, very often, diversity for the sake of diversity, with each one claiming to be a victim and therefore to be right, that is destructive for me. Mm -hmm. It does not help at all. So all depends on if we find a common ground. If we only find our own echo rooms and not more and our preferred, uh, I don't know what internet or, or newspapers and others and live in our old small world. No, on the contrary. Mm -hmm. Anti-Semitism can be expressed as one means of diversity. So we need this common basis. If not, we cannot work. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Can I? Yes, of course. Okay. I'm afraid it was a wonderful lecture and um, I, I would have one very specific question about uh, Hamburg, since you come from Hamburg. And it is concerned with the uh, golden century in the Netherlands, so the 17th century, where the Jewish community had an important role in the flourishing of the Netherlands. And uh, my question is, uh, uh, any uh, relation or anything that has to do with the attitude in Hamburg and the, in what remained of the Anseatic League in the 17th century toward the other naval uh, uh, and commercial power that was uh, slightly more to the west? Ah, <laughs> Oliviero, <laughs> that requires a substantiated answer. Um, the Jews who came to us um, at the very end of the 16th and then in the 17th century, they came to a place which was not yet Hamburg as it is today. And the, the basic fact is uh, somewhat simplified, that the Jews first came to Altona, 
Altona was a Danish or Danish dominated city and a competitor to Hamburg. And again, it was like with Constantine and Charlemagne, the people of Altona invited the Jewish families because they were so well connected by Amsterdam until uh, to, to, to the Caribbean and other parts of the world. Hamburg, as it was then, was a relatively stout Protestant city, which had difficulties to accept uh, its Jewish community. So, and this, this part to link it with the Hanseatic League, which existed only on paper at that time, it had all but disappeared, or with the, with the historic liberality of the Hamburg uh, people, no, no, no. Uh, I think we are a relatively liberal city uh, and we had a thriving Jewish community before 33. Hamburg, as it was then, uh, was even called the Jerusalem of the North. Uh, and of course, we had eminent people uh, from the Jewish community which enriched Hamburg's life, not only Albert Berlin, but all in all, Perhaps the proud Hamburger would say we have been so liberal and, and anti-anti-Semitism, no, no, no. Uh, in, on average, the Hamburgers were as anti or pro-Semitic as the rest of the country, or roughly speaking. Yes, uh, I see here uh, Miki, yeah, yeah, please. Please unmute yourself. Hello. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lahnstein, for this really excellent, distinguished lecture. I'm Mickey, Pro, uh, Mickey Drill, project manager at the Israel office uh, of the Friedrich Ebert Foundation for 20 years now. And uh, uh, I have two specific uh, questions. Question number one, what do we know about the Wilhelm's, the emperor's personal attitude toward Jews? And I'm asking because, you know, my, the, the family of my uh, father, they come from uh, Austria. And I remember when I was a little child, I saw my grandmother crying and I asked her, why do you cry? And she said, well, I remember uh, uh, the funeral of the empire, Franz Josef in 1916. And I asked her, why do you cry? She said, because he was so good to the Jews. Uh, there will never be such a good person to as Jews again. So my question is, is it, uh, uh, how is uh, Wilhelm received uh, in his attitude toward, personal attitude toward Jews? This is one question. The second one is uh, regarding the Christian uh, streams of uh, Catholicism and uh, Protestant. Um, is there, can one say there is a degree of antisemitism if you compare this to streams, in other words, are, they, are uh, Catholic areas more anti-Semitic than uh, Protestant areas or the other way around? And also, if you know if there were any, um, any um, uh, if, if, if the churches tried to, uh, to start a dialogue between the Jewish communities even before the war, or is or the change which you mentioned, is it a only the after effect of the Shoah that the churches, both churches, churches uh, uh, started to fight anti-Semitism. What do we know about such uh, phenomena even before the war? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, as far as William II is concerned, I am not a specialist of <laughs> the old scholars. I really might know more about it on Thomas. You might know more about it. Uh, because they were all the strange people to me. But uh, you can assume that German nobility up to the emperor's level was not necessarily anti-Semitic, but they were very far from the realities of day-to-day -day life and Jewish life in particular. There have been, there have been anti-Semitic um, tints in, in, in parts of the wider families, of course, but that was a, not a generally established rule. On the other hand, uh, Wilhelm II, one of his closest friends was Albert Berlin, here from Hamburg, uh, a leading member of the overall Jewish community in, in Germany. But this 
probably had nothing to do with Albert Berlin being a Jew, but Albert Berlin being the, the largest and most important and most famous ship owner in the whole of Europe, which was very important for the armament of, 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 of the German Navy uh, ahead, of, ahead of World War I. I do not know more. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not a specialist historian, so I confess my, my lack of knowledge. Uh, as far as Protestant and Catholics are concerned, there, there has been a, a big discussion uh, in the earlier years of the Federal Republic. Now, of course, it is impossible because um, this purely Catholic or Protestant regions, sometimes even the predominantly Catholic or predominantly Protestants in, in Germany do no longer exist. And the cloud of both religions has diminished, diminished greatly over the last 20, 25 years. But um, in the Nazi party, this can be said, in the Nazi party or in the Nazi structure, because it was not only the party, but so many, many more structures, the Protestants were predominant. Protestants were predominant. And it has been said that many Catholics, although not being pro-Semitic or pro-Jewish, they had their firm belief which did not welcome anti-Semitism. We have had heroes on both sides, on the Protestant side as well, on the Catholic. But I would say, but this may be wrong because it's too long time that I read about it, uh, that all in all the structures of the, the Nazi power structure, if there was a religious foundation at all, then the Protestants were predominant. Eli, you wanted to ask a question. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Manfred, for this brilliant, uh, broad historical overview. And I want to raise a phenomena that I think that uh, connects old, very old anti-Semitism, as well as anti-Semitism today. And this is fake news. You know, a lot of the attitudes, the prejudice, the prosecution of Jews was based on lies that were told from, you know, the murder of Jesus uh, through the uh, Passover uh, uh, legends, etc. Today, you know, fake news is the main problem threatening liberal democracy. And in a sense, liberal democracy core value of freedom of speech, in a sense, ac accumulates and promotes the problem of democracy, but also anti-Semitism. So what can we do with fake news uh, with regard both to repairing our political system as well as our attitudes to minorities and especially the Jews? Thank you, Eddie. I personally believe that we should not make a too stringent comparison between the, the two broad periods you were mentioning. Uh, you, you, come, you come to the, what you called fake news in the very early Christian period, when Christian anti-Semitism, anti anti-Judaism would, be, I think, be the more word, but there is a big discussion even about this kind of definition. Um, that was part of the religious belief. And as part of the religious belief, that what you call fake news, murderers of Christ, became part of the dominating uh, opinion, sometimes forced upon via the church. Uh, that is different today. That, does not say that it is less uh, dangerous today. And as far as the negative influence of the so-called social media are concerned, um, I have to be very cautious. If not, I explode. Uh, and Sonia is sitting somewhere and she will have to, she will have to put a break on. 
and and you know my position. Uh, I think. What is what is being advocated um, is a better education, so-called media competence. How do we deal with these ways of expressing prejudice? And of course, there is a lot of there is a lot of truth in it, but it's for me it it, it, it is not good enough. Um, but I must say at the end of a relatively long life, I have found no convincing instruments, except of talking to other people. Of course, there are laws. Uh, and there are stout laws, especially in Germany. And they are, they are being adapted, I think, fortunately. So the rule of the law, I would not at all underestimate it on the contrary. But in the end, Nobody of us can live without prejudice. Now, most of these prejudices are completely harmless. All of us live with prejudice. As long as they are harmless, as long as we are able to recognize them as prejudice and then fight it, I think everything is okay. But these people you were referring to, Ailey, I think they do not even recognize it. They do not talk about fake news. They are talking of what they believe is the truth. And then it's very difficult to, to make a debate. I'm reading a lot about, especially this issue. I have not found a valid answer. That is sad, but that is the way it is. For me, I hope you have better answers, all of you. Other question, please. Valerio. Yes. Hi. Thank you, Manfred. Um, I think that um, the, the diversity and the identity are two words of the same category. Uh, the diversity is a different way to think in terms of identity, where the term I is in the center. So I ask you uh, if you think that it could be a good chance to move the education to think in terms of identity, move in a way to think in terms of membership, because I can be a member of a lot of communities, but it's no problem of identity. I don't. Uh, leave myself, uh, myself, and I can be in more communities. And so the, the prejudice against uh, uh, Judaism and uh, Zionism, <laughs> that different thing, I think it's, uh, it's also uh, could be uh, involved in this kind of uh, uh, mythology of identity. I don't know what you think about it. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, for decades now, the simple observation that we all live not in an identity, but in identities in the plural has convinced me uh, deeply. And it is correct. Each one of you, you, you look into yourself, you have various identities in yourself. As long as you recognize this fact, and as long as you do not take one of those identities as the absolute, absolutely dominating one, I think one has made a great step forward. The, the, the problem is, again, with those people, which I feel we cannot reach, is that they would not, not accept it. For them, it's one of the different entities, uh, identities they are living with, which is dominating the rest, dominating the rest. And that is so difficult, but, but it, it, I think it helps a lot because you talk to whom you want to talk. It is relatively easy 
to at least show him or her that she or he is living in a variety of uh, of identities. Uh, I see my my <laughs> our close partner Guido sitting there. I once made a joke with him, and, and we defined our entities. We easily came up with five or six or seven different identities. This is as as an instrument of of of, of enlightening people, of talking to people. I think it's very valuable. Yes. Are there other questions? So I have one question, uh, Professor uh, Lernstein. I really uh, enjoyed your lecture. And once again, I, I'm really uh, fascinated by your commitment uh, toward Judaism. Uh, and I'm asking out of this discussion about identities and uh, the way of transforming oneself, what brought you personally to this uh, uh, so friendly attitude toward the history of Judaism? It, was there a personal encounter or something uh, in your life or re your reading or a mix of the two? Or I would be very interested. And I think uh, uh, most of us would be interested to understand uh, what was at the beginning of your passion for uh, the Jewish history and the connection between German and Jewish history? That comes via Israel. Hmm? Um, it didn't start with Jewish history. It started with Israel and via Israel with the Jews in Germany and the, of course the Shoah period. I grew up after the war, I'm born in 37. So after the war, I was a boy. My father died in 46. So I could never ask him, never discuss with him. And, and uh, anti-Semitism or Jewish life was no topic for me. I was born in a small village. Apparently there was one Jewish family in the village, but nobody know, knew of course what happened to them. And it was only really, um, when the the uh, Eichmann trial and the not only Eich, uh, Auschwitz but other extermination camp trials came about, I have to tell this story. And forgive me, that may take three minutes. In Düsseldorf, there was the Treblinka trial. Treblinka was the extermination camp where out of hundreds of thousands of murdered Jews, 54 had survived. Much more brutal than one could imagine. And the guy who ran the, 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 the camp, Franz Stangl, under a different name, he lived as a waiter in a Düsseldorf restaurant. He was caught. So the trial took place in Düsseldorf. And I was working in Düsseldorf at that time because I grew up there. And a friend of mine who was a member of the jury of this trial, he said, you have to come and see this. And I was sitting in the, in the um, hall of the court of justice, exactly the first day when the testimonials were heard. Out of the 54 survivors of Srebrenica, 41 or 42 had come to Düsseldorf and they were sitting there in the corner, small people, very subdued people. I said to myself, they should be furious. No. And then Franz Stange, the, 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 the camp boss came in, erect, tall, proud, and while coming in, he looked into the corner where the testimonies, how do you say, uh, were sitting. 
and the absolute fear and absolute terror. And we are talking about 63 or 64. And then shook me so much that I had to go out and I threw up because I could not understand it. And so from there on, I started to study and thank God my first trip to Israel came about already in 1967, before the Six Days War. Then you get more and more interested. You make, you make uh, friends. Uh, it's not too difficult to be friendly to other people. Uh, but you had this, you had these, these experiences. Uh, Fania and Eli, they know that uh, on on Kineret. There was no Kinosar. We went there because a major politician was dwelling there. We wanted to discuss politics. And in the morning, it was the first ghetto in the kibbutz in the whole of Israel, was in Kinosar, modern building, very beautiful. In the morning, I woke up very early, went to the lake to take a swim, go to the lake, and then all of a sudden, let's say it's 20 meters from me, two people, two ladies, we're talking in Cologne dialect. I said, what is this? Your own dialect. I'm from Düsseldorf, so that is not very far away. And I, I wanted to go there and, and say hello. And then I see one of the ladies with a number of Auschwitz on the, on the arm. And I did not have the courage to, to address them. So in the beginning, there are these very emotional experience and then comes the intellectual curiosity and I have had thank God I've had enough time to uh, to foster it and, and to learn I still learn I still learn many thanks for sharing this uh, personal uh, experience and background other questions before we close our meeting I just want to say how moved I am really. You know, all these years, I think I'm having tears. Uh, Manfred and everybody, you know, it's uh, so emotional for me to be here, to be with you and to know that 20 years have passed and I was part of quite a lot of it. <laughs> and thank you so much, uh, Manfred. Thank you, Leah. I cannot see your tears, thank God, but you changed <laughs> the address. <laughs> But I did. <laughs> all of us, next year is 50 years of the university. They all of us try their best to come to Haifa. And this year, what will be a great, a great year of peace together. And uh, hopefully in more peaceful times than those which we are living through right now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much, Professor Thank you, Manfred. Wonderful to host you. Thank you very much, Manfred. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. It was very Thank interesting. You so much. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Very Thank you, Manfred. Manfred. Thank you all. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. Yeah. Oh, man, yeah. Se callaron los dos, los dos juntos se callaron. Okay. <laughs>